Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox and thanks for logging on. Today, everything is for sale because we are starting our weekend with watches. Reach out to Tmaso with thewatchbox.com with your questions about pricing, availability, accessories, and if you wish, we can supply extra photos. Reach out to Tmaso with thewatchbox.com as well. If you are interested in buying, trading, or selling watches, we do all three. Trade up for something you're more likely to wear or enjoy, or even sell a collection. Every single watch, cash paid, no upper limit on value paid. We pay cash, we pay fast, we make the process easy. And FYI, if you do want to trade towards a new watch, remember there are all sorts of benefits to taking a trade value towards a new watch as opposed to paying full cash, much like a trade value towards a car replacement uh, gives you special tax advantages when the trade is factored in. So reach out to Team Also at thewatchbox.com for purchase and pricing details. I promised you a JLC Master Chronograph, and that's what we have here. A super underrated piece from a brand that deserves to be considered in the upper echelon of both modern and historical watch manufacturers. What's special here is just how much you get. Now, the watch, of course, 40 millimeters in stainless steel. This is not the Aston Martin version. So if you don't want automotive co-branding, there's none of it. The watch is relatively slim at 12.6 millimeters thick, and it's got a lovely combination of a white metal case and a black lacquer dial applique indices. There is a little bit of luminescence. It's not a hugely loomed watch, but it's got some such that you can read it in the dark. It features JLC's own manufacturer caliber 751 inside, automatic winding, two barrels, 65 hour power reserve, vertical clutch, column wheel, free sprung, and yes, it's been through the master one. 1,000 hours control, so it is both reliable and accurate. Taking a quick look, we get a deploying clasp and matching steel. At 40 millimeters, this feels like a standard-sized, all-around men's chronograph today. It's not oversized, it's not undersized. It's nostalgic in its proportions, but it's very contemporary in its dimensions. And you can see on my 16 centimeters circumference wrist, it wears quite well. This needs to be considered as an all-arounder rather than a dress watch, as you truly can wear this for just about everything except aquatic exploits. Now, let's say you do want to go swimming, but you want a watch that has some dress chops. Well, in 1995, Chrono Swiss launched the first serially produced skeleton chronograph, the Opus. And in 2021, the Reborn Chrono Swiss, now based out of Lucerne, Switzerland, re-released the Opus. Here it is, 41 millimeters in steel, now with a rubber strap and a 100 meter water resistance. So if you want to take this in the water, you absolutely can. Throwing it on the wrist. It is larger than in the past, but it's also a good fit for my wrist, partly because of the way the lugs are shaped. It's substantial, and I do think you need a wrist of my size, 16 centimeters circumference or larger to wear it. But if you've got that wrist, game on. It looks good. It feels good. It's unlike anything else in its price range, and it has real history behind it. As Chrono Swiss, established in 1983, was one of the original independent watch brands, first by G.R. Long, and then later by the Epstein, uh, husband and wife team that revived the company from 2012 forward. So it's always been closely held and run by a small group of people who believe deeply in the product. Now, taking a look, you can see part of the excitement of the dial is that you don't give up any functionality or legibility. Yes, you can see the movement. It's a version of a Valjoux 7750. They call it the 741 here. It's been skeletonized by use of a pantograph mimicry lathe, which is very similar to the system that's used to cut the dials for the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak. It's an automatic wander with a 46 hour power reserve. It has a stop seconds function. And then fascinatingly, it also has a quick set that incorporates a radial date over at three o'clock and unusual usual implementation of a date with quick set on a modern watch, but this is true to the history of the Opus. And unlike most skeleton watches, it's easy to tell here what the actual time is because all of the hands stand out quite well against the background. We have a rubber strap with a lot of substance and durability engineered in, a twin trigger release in a clasp of thick gauge steel that frankly feels like something you'd find on a sports watch. So there's a large measure of security here. You can actually pop the buckle open, you put the strap through and then you pin it and clasp it in place so it's absolutely going to stay put. No danger of slippage or droppage when this is on your wrist. We'll take a quick look now at the case back real quick. You can see it's still a cam lateral clutch chrono as the 7750 has long been. But with an oscillating pinion, the 7750 architecture has always made for a very steady and seamless engagement of the chronograph in a way that very few lateral clutch chronographs can. You press and you hold, 
and it's almost as seamless as a vertical clutch. By the way, how much do you love the Tasty Tondi style chronograph pushers? Okay, now let's say we want to go completely off the rails. Well, in 2000, Corum did exactly that with the original Bubble. Inspired by the 1950s and 60s Rolex Deep Sea Special, the idea here was to stick an 11 millimeter thick sapphire crystal on top of an ornate base that is fundamentally a steel sports watch, but has a wonderful organic profile unlike anything else in the watch business. Now, the timepiece you see here is the 2006 777 piece steel Baron Samedi limited edition based on the Loi of Haitian voodoo mythology, or I should say Haitian voodoo faith because it is a religion. Uh, he is the god of the dead. He is the spirit who is the patron saint of the dead, I should say. But he also has a side interest in general debauchery, smoking, drinking, and carrying on. So he's a good subject for a quorum bubble. Now you can see this is an enormous sapphire crystal, which helps to shield the watch from any kind of blows that might cause a scratch, scuff, or a dent. The timepiece has a wonderfully elaborate dial. You, get, you have to have a certain sense of humor to wear something like this, but if you get it, you get it. If you don't, nothing I could say can convince you. It has a remarkably robust clasp, and it also has a strap of high quality that is quasi integrated into the band of the case. As you can see, there's no daylight showing between them. On the reverse side, you can see it says Voodoo on the rotor. It is a high grade ETA 2892, I believe, in top grade. And the watch is surprisingly 200 meters water resistant. So you actually get quite a lot of resilience here. You can see it says Voodoo on the rotor and it's a 2892A2 base. Uh, individually numbered, this is 762 of 777. It came out in 2006, uh, which was right before the bubble went on hiatus for a while. The design created by former Quorum chief Severin Wunderman was easily the most recognizable Quorum product of the 2000s, even more so, frankly, than the Admiral's Cups and the Golden Bridge. And they are wonderfully fun to wear. And again, a heck of a lot more affordable than something like a Royal Oak Offshore or an Hublot Big Bang with the same degree of, well, should we say, uh, sporting durability and wrist presence because all of those are sports watches. This one just costs far less than $10,000. But there are some who will find that to be an aberration and they prefer a classically traditional watch, both in size and in style. And this is the Grand Seiko SBGW 283 Kishun, which is designed to celebrate the look atop Mount Awate in the early summer. Now, the watch is a hand-wound three-day power reserve in a 37.7 millimeter black polished that is Zeratsu finished steel case. The dial is much like the Kirazuri series from six years ago and that has a rusticated and roughed metallic finish in almost periwinkle blue. All of the features of the dial are applied by hand and the movement on the reverse side is made by a watchmaker, tuned by a watchmaker, and when the time comes, it is serviced by a watchmaker, the 9S64 manual wind. It's got a three-day power reserve six position adjustment guaranteed to run no worse than minus three plus five seconds per 24 hours which is actually even better than a COSC certified Swiss chronometer is required to run to get the certificate. I love Alango Unzuna, and although it hasn't been an independent brand now for 23 years, or I should say, yeah, 23 years, since it was purchased by Richemont back in 2000, it still has the spirit of an independent, and with about 5,000 to 6,000 watches made each year, it's still in that production bracket that roughly equates to what RM makes annually. The difference is Longa watches are much more involved a project than most RMs. Most RMs are exercises in a tablissage, whereas Longa is responsible for its own mechanisms. So this is the Richard Longa Jumping Seconds in White Gold. This model, as you see it here, debuted in 2019. It's 39.9 millimeters in diameter. It is white gold. It has a dial made of sterling silver, galvanized black. We have this triple overlapping Johann Seifert scale, and we have deadbeat seconds. We have hours, we have minutes, and so you combine all these separate displays. It is a deadbeat second, but it's also a regulator. When it's down to 10 hours of power reserve or less remaining, this little index down here turns red. It's a sort of last call power reserve warning to let you know your watch is about to run down. And you can see that as I wind the watch, eventually the red will actually lapse. What it also has is a dead 
Deadbeat second with zero reset. So you actually have a zero reset function to align with the index so you can set the watch precisely against a known accurate reference time. Taking a look at the reverse of the watch, there's another feature. There is a remontoire de galette, so it also has a constant force device so that through the 42 hour power reserve, the balance continues to get even torque impulses, ensuring that you get constant amplitude, and thus uh, this watch, which is regulated in five positions, maintains exquisitely consistent timekeeping, even when highly wound or highly discharged. And this watch also has a free sprung balance. You can see that it uses a combination of features not commonly seen on longer watches. Let's get a little bit closer here. The execution is first rate. The hairspring is an overcoil. This is very rarely seen on longer timepieces. You'll see it on the datograph, a few other chronographs, and some prestige pieces. To have that refinement here speaks to the level of importance this watch, outwardly simple, occupies inside the Longa catalog. And of course, this being a Longa watch, the finishing inside and out is world class and as good as anything you are going to find. Flipping it over one more time, you can see that the golden hued bridges and plates are a nickel copper zinc alloy known as German silver. We have pivot jewels set in chaton or golden cups fixed by screws. We have freehand engraving on the balance cock. We have black polish on the swan's neck fine adjustment, several of the screws, as well as the cap atop the escape wheel. And then you can see a skeletonization that allows you to see the hairspring between the two third wheels that acts as the remontoir constant force device. A very, very, very special watch and one of the finest timepieces you will find in its price point and in its size class, as watches with this much complication tend to be a lot larger. Looking back to the late 90s, it's clear that Roger Dewey was one of the pioneers. Originally established in 1995 as Sogem, the company later known as Roger Dewey became one of the original independent watch brands established by a combination of Carlos Diaz and Roger Dubuis. Dubuis lent his name and his watchmaking authority to the company, creating models like the Condottiere, the Homage, and the Sympathie. This is the Sympathie, a watch 37 millimeters in diameter with by retrograde perpetual calendar. It is the first generation Sympathie case that has this wonderful flowing exterior, but you can see that the inner bezel, the crystal, and the dial also trace the same pattern. Later on, it would be circular inboard even as the contours were retained outboard. These earlier watches with the symmetry of bezel, crystal, and dial, these are highly sought collectibles today. We have a Roger Dubuis caliber 5707, which is the Longines L990, modified with Geneva Hallmark finish, the perpetual calendar complication, and if you note up at the top of the dial, it says Bulletin d'Observatoire. It is a Besançon French certified observatory chronometer, in addition to being Geneva Hallmark standard finish. And you can see that well on the reverse side. It is quite beautifully decorated. My favorite details uh, being the swan's neck fine adjustment mechanism and the exquisite Roger Dubuis logo on the partially skeletonized rotor. Twin barrels, 44 hour power reserve, automatic winding, four hertz beat rate. We have a set of alpha style hands that have been half frosted for better contrast over this lush and lovely white lacquer dial. We do have a moon phase. You've got a retrograde day, a retrograde date. You've got your month and your coaxial leap year phase indicator. And then the moon phase at the bottom with a matching white gold deployant clasp. At 37 millimeters, you might think it's a tiny watch, but because of the shape of the lugs, it actually wears fairly large. I have no problem wearing it on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist, but I do think you need a wrist of at least 15 centimeters circumference to wear this well. That said, it is not a thick watch, easily sliding underneath a dress cuff. You're gonna find it's a good fit. As long as you can handle it laterally, it's gonna easily fit underneath a sleeve. So it's a great dress watch. And by the way, this is almost identical to the Roger Dubuis watch that Dubuis himself wore right up until his death. So you have a very close link to the man himself with this model. We love our independent brands here at Watchbox, and so Grubel and Forsey often come up. Robert Grubel and Stephen Forsey were originally 
Watchmakers who worked for Audemars Piguet, Renault et Papi, later they designed mechanisms for other brands through their Complatime venture. And in 2004, they launched this, the first watch they built jointly under their own names. This is the Grubel 4C Double Tourbillon 30 Degree. So it's exactly what the name implies. Inside a 43.5 millimeter rose gold case with a sine wave on the exterior, we have two tourbillon regulators, one featuring the serpentine, quad spoke wheel that actually is a four minute tourbillon so you can see the little scale just below the hands is a one minute scale that allows each branch of the serpentine to cover 60 seconds we have a conventional sub seconds over at nine o'clock a power reserve indicator at three and then inside the four minute tourbillon we have a second tourbillon a one minute tourbillon that is inclined at 30 degrees and so even if the watch is sitting on your dresser at night, because that inner tourbillon is angled at 30 degrees, it will cancel out the effects of gravity when the watch is not on the wrist, helping to establish effectively the same phenomenon that Abraham Louis Breguet recognized in the late 18th century when he first conceived the tourbillon, which is using gravity to your advantage to cancel out, well, gravity, by exposing every corner of the tourbillon, the hairspring, and the regulator to gravity, it evens out the positions in which the tourbillon runs fast and slow for optimized timekeeping. Finishing is also world class. You could see all of that black polish, both on the tourbillon cage itself and on the bridge structure. The movement's made of German silver, but wonderfully gold gilded. A wire brush is used to create the frosted surfaces. There's satination on the base plate, two barrels, 72 hour power reserve. You can see the underside of the tourbillon structure is as elaborate as the top. And then if you look carefully, you can see the anglage is a mile wide. Details that no one else really sweats, like interior beveling of wheels are signatures of Grubel 4C watchmaking. Then we have jewels set in golden chiton, a nod to how things were done in Grubel 4C's home of La Chaux de Fonds during the 19th and 18th century. Taking a quick look at the watch on the wrist, it does fit. It's 52 millimeters lug to lug, so it's large. But if your wrist is my size, 16 centimeters circumference or larger, you're gonna find it's a really good fit. It's also visually spectacular. So a little bit more watch and a little bit more tourbillon, in this case, isn't offensive. It's downright appealing. Okay, here's a special one. Have you guessed? Because I think that if I keep this thing in focus, you're gonna be able to see the name on the dial because there's so much loom here. All right, let's find out if you guessed right. Franck Muller, founded back in 1992, was the Richard Mille of the 1990s. It was the IT brand. It was known for fabulously expensive watches, gala affairs atop skyscrapers and at motorsports events. It had a roster of celebrity ambassadors from the world of sports, music, and film. And of course, its case shapes were iconic for their period. Well, Franck Muller ultimately, I don't want to say sold out, but transitioned to a mainstream existence that included far more simple watches, often powered by Soprod, ETA, or Salida movements, and yet they were always blazing with the signature master of complications. How about we look at a real complicated Franck watch? Here it is right here. This is the Franck Muller Long Island Imperial Tourbillon. Now, the Long Island series launched in 2000, and the Torbion caliber here, the FM 2001, launched in 2001. This was the tail end of the era in which Franck was still actually involved in the company. And so this watch still bears the marks of the master. We have a tourbillon, which Muller himself helped make famous in wristwatches back when he was still a practicing independent watchmaker during the 1980s. And what we get is a flying tourbillon that features the company logo. You can see it also on the crown, but it has no upper bridge to block the view, and you can see it's been fully engraved. It's a one-minute tourbillon beating away at 18,000 vibrations per hour, and this movement, a manual wind, features a 60-hour power reserve. You can even see that the underside of the barrel has been freehand engraved along with the entirety of the movement. The edges of the bridges are mirror beveled, and you can see that well here, and the same treatment is applied to all of the jewel sinks. There is lots to love 
from the fact that it's entirely handmade to the fact that some of the features the case back says such as the individual numbering those are also hand engraved the watch in white gold is 54 millimeters from lug tip to lug tip under 12 millimeters thick and 32.5 millimeters from side to side you can see it's a seamless mono block case as there is no break between the bezel and the case they're one piece everything loads through the reverse of the watch now the long island series was designed to celebrate the roaring 20s style that originated among other things jazz as pop music the flapper as a cultural phenomenon and of course runaway speakeasy parties and galas on Long Island itself. So back in the era of prohibition, you could go to a speakeasy, but if you wanted to really party, you would go to East Egg or West Egg. I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit right there. There are no East and West Eggs, but on the North Shore of Long Island, places much like the scenes from The Great Gatsby actually existed. And this watch is a tribute to that Long Island North Shore scene at the height of the Roaring Twenties. If you've read The Great Gatsby, you know exactly where I'm coming from. If you haven't, highly recommended. The watch is large and in charge, and it dominates even my wrist. You can see at 16 centimeters circumference, I probably have the smallest wrist that could wear this watch, and that's a good thing, because as a native Long Islander, it simply wouldn't do if I couldn't don this timepiece. But it is low. You'll see it slips underneath the cuff. A comfortable watch, a spectacular watch, and a watch that really does live up to Franck Muller's billing as a master of complications. For once, I can actually share one with you that has complications. This, co-equally with the new Tantalum Lapis Style Endeavor Perpetual, might be my favorite Moser. Launched in 2021, this is the 42 millimeter white gold, fully enameled Heritage Perpetual Calendar. It's a 20 piece limited edition. Incredibly, it's only about 46 millimeters lug to lug. So while the case is fairly large, the watch is actually very compact on the wrist. You can see these lugs are coming nowhere near the edges of my wrist. Even from over the top, you can see I've got plenty of clearance. And it's a fairly thin watch as well, in spite of its seven day power reserve, power reserve indicator and bi-directional perpetual calendar. It's very, very wearable. The Heritage Collection from Moser is sometimes described as a pilot watch series, but in truth, it is a tribute to watches made by Moser during the 20s and 30s that had this general appearance, but were not expressly marketed as pilot's watches. But we do have the look of a converted pocket watch with the round case, the onion crown, lugs that look as though they could have been welded on, and a very ornate radially arrayed set of Roman numerals on a that also includes assegai or spear-shaped hands. The watch does have a blue enamel dial, real fired vitreous enamel with all that entails. It's got a little bit of a smoked gradient from dark blue to almost black at the edge. It has Andreas Streller's brilliant bi-directional perpetual calendar system that he created for Moser. So you get an oversized set of overlapping discs, so you get a giant digit without one giant disc. Now you can see as I adjust forward and backwards, it's a bi-directional perpetual calendar, 12 hours, 12 months, a little stub hand indicates the current month. And here I am jumping forward and backwards between December and January. Pull the crown out all the way, you activate stop seconds so you can stop the watch. There's a power reserve indicator at nine o'clock. The watch is rated to seven, though in truth these things run for almost nine. Taking a quick look, this seven to nine day movement is encased inside a vessel that it has been cut with guilloche engines on the exterior and then over that translucent enamel has been applied and fired so this is flinke enamel on the case itself the movement is second to none this is the hmc 800 Manual wind, twin barrels, you can see each one fit in a screw-fixed golden chaton. We have the leap year phase indicator on the reverse side, because when Andrea Storello designed this system for Moser, he reasoned that the leap year phase is the least important and least frequently referenced sign on a perpetual calendar, so we put it where it would not be missed. Now, we also have a little pusher adjuster on the flank, so you can jump that if you want. Solid gold, 14 carat escapement for reduced friction and minimal lubrication. It beats away at a nostalgic 18,000 vibrations per hour with an overcoil hairspring and a full balance bridge with a free sprung balance for durability. The entire escapement balance and 
assortment assembly lifts out so that when the watch goes to regional service at a Moser service center, they can put in a pre-oiled and lubricated assortment. The whole thing just goes in as a platform so the watch can be returned to you with utmost dispatch. Nicely decorated, it features black polished screw heads, double crested coat dish nev. You can see how though the bridges are split for ease of service, they do have the look of a pocket watch three quarter bridge along with those jewels and chiton all the way down to the escapement itself. We have a swan's neck style click spring, much like in a pocket watch. And you can see that the crown wheel core has been satinated while the edge of the crown wheel has been black polished. It's a handsomely detailed, thoughtfully designed watch and one of my absolute favorites from Moser. It really does wear quite compact. In spite of being a 42, it doesn't wear anything like a 42. Think of it as more of a 40 on the wrist. And it features a option rarely seen on Moser watches, even flagships, which is a full matching white gold Moser deployant clasp. If you like enamel, but you want more focused imagery, well, Patek Philippe has something for you. Made from 2019 through 2021, this is the 5231J, so a world-time cloisonne enamel watch. You set your current city of reference at 12 o'clock, so currently I'm in Dubai, where it is approaching 6 o'clock, a quarter to 6, and, well, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to change my reference city to Sydney, and now it does all of the work for me. You can see it's a quarter to midnight in Sydney. This is the Louis Cotier World Time System that features 24 reference cities for the world's 24 principal time zones. And then we have this counterclockwise rotating, a 24-hour reference ring. So you just set your reference city up the top. That's the time represented by the hands. But then you look at the hour adjacent to each one of these cities or regions to tell the time there. So you can see in Buenos Aires, it is 12 noon. You could see that we are looking at twilight in the desert and then we have in Anchorage, Alaska, it's 6 a.m., so they're just about to pass into day. They're on the cusp of their own twilight. The watch is 38.5 millimeters in yellow gold, but what really sets it apart is in the world time or the gold. It is the fact that the dial here featuring the Americas, the Middle East, Africa, and Europe, it is both Grand Faux enamel using multiple colors and different thicknesses of enamel for different shades of the colors, and then it has cloison or little gold wires that are used create boundaries into which the enamel is supplied to create the image of the land masses. And then, of course, it's fired up to 20 times at 800 degrees centigrade. The dial base is solid gold, so it is truly artisanal and handcrafted. On the reverse side, we have the caliber 240 Heure Universelle or HU. It is a micro rotor automatic that's thin like a manual with the big open display case back you get on a manual, but with the convenience of an automatic. So we don't have a rotor and a winding bridge blocking our view here. It is a 48 hour power reserve, a six beat per second rate or three hertz. It's free sprung with a gyro max style balance adjusted in six positions. And when you combine the anti-magnetic silicon hairspring with the gyro max balance, six position adjustment, and the Patek Philippe seal, the watch is guaranteed to run no worse than minus three plus two seconds per day from the factory. Again, far in excess of the standards set by the COSC. This is far better than a COSC chronometer in terms of actual timekeeping. It fits easily underneath the cuff. It wears well on a smaller wrist, and you can see that it has a full matching yellow gold deployment clasp. That said, when it comes to yellow gold, give me the 1998 to 2002 Patek Philippe 5070J, a watch based on the 1950s giant reference 2512 split seconds chronograph. The 5070J arrived in 1998 at 42 millimeters for a dress watch. It was considered to be monstrous. The only comparable watches at the time were things like the Royal Oak Offshore, the Panerai Luminor, and on the dress watch side, it was pretty much the IWC Portuguesa or nothing. So this watch was shocking in its scale, even if the original from the 50s was 55 millimeters, 42 was plenty to raise eyebrows at Basel in 1998. Now, the original version of the watch was black dial and yellow gold, the closest in appearance to the original 2512. Later on in 2002, we would get white gold. In 2004, we would get rose gold. And then 
the final build out from 2008 to 2009 was platinum. So they could make about 250 watches per metal per year. So only about a thousand of these exist in the world. Now this one I'm showing here because it's in such good condition. It's a document of what the watch would have looked like when it left Patek. This one was retailed on the 6th of January in the year 2000, which guarantees that it was made in 1999. And apparently in 1999, they were still stamping hallmarks on the lateral facets of the case and the lugs. Moreover, you could see how deep and well-defined they are, along with the sharpness of the case lip and the bezel, and the deep, well-defined fluting of the lugs. These are signs of both the times in the way it was hallmarked, but also the condition of the watch, as in particular, the sharpness on the edge of the bezel and case and the fluting of the lugs are the first things to go when these are excessively refinished. I'll throw it on my wrist real quick, then we'll take a look at the watch inverted. The watch is large, but it doesn't wear terribly broad. You can see it's nowhere near the edge of my wrist. So if your wrist is 15 centimeters circumference or larger, you're going to wear this well. On the reverse side, we have caliber CH2770. Based on the Le Mans 2310, it's in good company with movements like the Omega 321 that went to the moon. There are quite a few mods from the standard version of the watch, but I'm just going to give you the specs of this watch in Patek trim, which is, well, Manual wind, 60 hour power reserve, 2.5 hertz beat rate, free sprung gyro max style balance, overcoil hairspring, six position adjustment, lateral clutch, column wheel, 24 jewels, and immaculately executed with the Geneva Hallmark. This is old school pre Patek Philippe seal. Everything is finished to the highest standard. It's a huge mechanical upgrade over the basic La Magna. Just think of something as basic as power reserve. The standard Le Mans has a 48 hour power reserve. This has a 60. Standard Le Mans has a flat hairspring. This has an overcoil. Standard Le Mans does not have a free sprung balance. This has Gyromax. And of course, standard Le Mans is not Geneva seal. It comes with a matching folding clasp. If you're going to get a 5070 and you can't grab platinum, this would be my recommendation to you. Heck, if you ask me which 5070 I want, price notwithstanding, it would still be this one. You gotta wonder what I have up my sleeve when the 5002 Sky Moon Tourbillon is the penultimate watch of the show and not the finisher. Well, let's take a look at this watch, which debuted back in 2001, 42.8 millimeters in platinum with 12 complications or 12 functions, I should say. It was at the time Patek Philippe's most complicated wristwatch and first ever double-sided wristwatch. On the reverse side, we have a sky chart. And the sky chart shows you the literal sky over your head at any given time in the northern hemisphere. It shows you the orbit and phase of the moon, and it gives you sidereal time defined as the passage of a star two times across a meridian of longitude. We have hands at center that give us the conventional clock time. And then you can see that if you turn the crown in the opposite direction, it adjusts the moon phase. And this is magic to me, as it features multiple overlapping sapphire discs, and it gives you a literal picture of the sky exhaustively recreated. The lugs are massive and welded on, and they use screws and bars to fix this watch to your wrist, and that's good, because these are now worth over $3 million. And from 2001 to 2012, regular production of this watch was maxed out at 10 per year if demand reached 10 per year, which it didn't always, and estimates for full production of all four metals, platinum, yellow, rose, and white gold, about 100 to 120 pieces. So this is rarefied air. The case band has been freehand engraved, and you can see the same treatment has been lavished on the slide for the repeater. The dial also guilloche with the Geneva, or I should say the Calatrava cross, which is the symbol of Patek Philippe. You can see it all over this watch. There is a serial number on the dial, which is why I have it covered up. It has a tourbillon inside that you can't see it. It's there for the addition of precision, psychological satisfaction, and I guess your Patek Philippe watchmaker's satisfaction, because he will be the only one to see it. We have a perpetual calendar with a retrograding date. We have a phase of the moon on both sides, also age of the moon. We have a minute repeater. We have a sky chart. We have lunation, orbit, phase of the moon, sidereal time, and then the repeater which strikes 32 times if you set it to the theoretical maximum strike, uh, which is 1259. The watch features cathedral gongs, which encircle the movement not one time like a conventional minute repeater, but one and a half times. 
So I'm going to try to set this watch to 12.59 so you can enjoy the minute repeater at its best. Early examples of this watch were COSC chronometer certified, later Patek Philippe seal, guaranteed to run no worse than minus one plus two seconds per day. Boom, just like that. This watch has a boxed set that includes the only hallmarked solid gold trim I've ever seen on a watch box. And you can see I could wear it. I couldn't wear it were my wrist any smaller, but if your wrist is 16 centimeters circumference or larger, you can absolutely wear this watch. And yes, it is full box papers and accessory set. And here's my finisher. Who says you need more than two hands? to be a great Patek Philippe. This is the 5088-100P uh, watch that's only 38 millimeters in diameter and just over eight millimeters thick in platinum. You can see it as the top Vesselton diamond between the lugs. The model was launched in 2016 on the 5088 Calatrava platform that's often used as a basis for craft works like engraving, enameling, miniature painting, or marquetry. So it's a two-hand watch with no date, no seconds, and in profile you can see it has been freehand engraved and then the flanks have been enameled on each side. You can also appreciate the dial is both Grand Faux enamel in black, the toughest to achieve, and it's a solid gold dial with freehand engraved arabesque and volute decoration. The watch is stunning in every regard, and normally I like to talk about movements, but you had the introduction to the 240 with the 5231J, so you don't need to know anything about this movement here other than it allows the watch to be as thin as it is and still an automatic winder. The bezel is almost completely flat. No two of these are exactly alike because of the hand engraved nature of both the case and the dial. And yes, this is an application piece and a person named Stern has to approve your application to own the watch in each case. Good news, we have this one ready to go. Reach out to tmosso at thewatchbox.com for purchase and pricing details. Thanks for logging on and enjoy your weekend.